And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. All right, good day to you. God bless you. Say, welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. We're ready to get back in our Father's Word, Book of Romans, chapter 11, verse 22. Kind of what I like to call the cap, if you would, to the Great Commission. That is to say, it emphasizes and amplifies what happened on the day of the crucifixion when the veil was rent from the top to the bottom, not from the bottom to the top, meaning it was done from above by Almighty God to open the Holy of Holies whereby whomsoever would. And he speaks about the tree of life. And within this, let me just let some scriptures that pop into my mind. In Matthew, it's, I was sent but to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Well, this has changed now. The price was paid, and salvation is open to all people, whomsoever will, whomsoever will. So with that, that's kind of what this is about, taking the tree of life and let anyone who wants to believe and have faith upon him to believe the word of God, the word that was given, even if you would, to the ancient Hebrews and um, the ten tribes that went north. And of course, many of them call themselves Gentiles today because they don't know. God has never lost anyone. But we got a lot of people in the ten tribes that went north. And unfortunately, in ignorance, most people try to, really, in Christians especially, they try to stack all twelve tribes into the tribe of Judah. That won't, that won't cut it. The house of Israel is separate at this time until the sticks are joined again from the house of Judah. So, biblically speaking. So, be that as it may, this is the crowning glory here of where our Heavenly Father documents that He loves all of His children and exactly how His plan of salvation uh, plays itself out, His method of operation how it's going to go down. I don't know. Where are you going to be? Well, you'll figure it out. Chapter 11, the genealogy of Paul in verse 1 and leading up to the tree of life, accepting all that will believe with the symbolism of a, of, of a tame olive tree with wild olives growing therein. I might say at the same time, that's a little reverse in horticulture because usually you graft in the tame into the wild to produce better fruit. Just, just in passing to let you know how our Father loves his children. 11 of 22, great book of Romans, a word of wisdom from our Father, and it reads, Behold, therefore, the goodness and severity of God on them which fell severity, but toward thee goodness. Give him a little severe punishment, and that's good for anyone to be, you know, that's tough love, quite frankly. If, that's a condition, if thou continue in his goodness, otherwise thou also shall be cut off. Speaking to those that were grafted in, those that were Gentile, literally, you, you act up, he'll, he'll clip your little vine right back off again. Verse 23, and they also... If they abide not still in unbelief, I say unbelief, shall be grafted in, for God is able to graft them in again. It's, you know, how many times do you forgive someone? You get certain of these denominations will teach, man, if you commit that sin, you're gone, that's it, no more. Well, unfortunately, most of them don't even know what the truly unforgivable sin is. And they... Um, they would send someone to hell for adultery when adultery, according to God's word, is, is not an unforgivable sin, all right? It's just, I'm just showing you the way you watch man, be careful of man's laws and stick and adhere to God's law when it comes to that that is spiritual and you'll be a lot better off. Verse 24. For if thou wert cut out of the olive tree, which is wild by nature, and wert grafted contrarily to nature into a good olive tree, how much more shall these, which be the natural branches, be grafted into their 
own olive tree. And of course, it's natural. If you even know horticulture, that's that you got a absolute fix there. I mean, it's easy to graft into the one of its own kind, and uh, much easier. Now, I want to remind you from the last lecture that Elijah was brought into this. I don't want you to forget the prophecy that Elijah would return just before the great day of the Lord, meaning the millennium, and that he would turn the father, the hearts of the children back to the fathers, plural. Fathers, plural, meaning Almighty God, and the other being Satan playing instead of Christ. Now, that was brought in, and I believe it was the fourth verse, that God had set aside 7,000, and that actually that's still future to this time. That's why it was brought up in this 11th chapter. That would stand against him at the very end. Why am I bringing up that now? Because this chapter covers the end also. I say that as we go into the next verse. Verse 25. For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery. And you're not, if you'll think for a moment. Lest ye should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. What's that talking about? Well, we could say, well, does that mean until all of them have a chance to be grafted in? Uh-uh. Fullness of time is something contrary. You read of it and probably may have forgotten in Luke 21. You read of the same thing in many other places. I won't go there. But I want you to turn with me to Luke chapter 21. I want you to pick it up with verse 22 and learn the mystery. It should not be a mystery to one of God's set-aside ones. Listen to it. For these be the days of vengeance, that all things which are written may be fulfilled. Well, what day is that? Seventh trump, right at the end. 23, but woe unto them that are with child and to them that give suck in those days, for there shall be great distress in the land and wrath upon this people. That's not talking about a mother with a child, natural child in her womb. That's talking about the virgin bride that's supposed to be a virgin when Christ returns and they've already messed around and accepted the false Messiah, which is what this chapter is about, chapter 21, and have been impregnated spiritually with his mark in their forehead. Now listen to verse 24. That's why we came here. And they shall fall by the edge of the sword and shall be led away captive into all nations, and Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times, times that is, of the Gentiles be fulfilled. So you see, the reason that it's important that you're aware of that mystery is so that you know the dispensation of time that Paul is talking about here so you're not caught off guard nor unaware. All right, verse, uh, returning then to chapter 11, the great book of Romans. In other words, he's talking about the end times to those that have eyes to see and ears to hear. That is to say 7,000, the number of completeness, spiritual completeness, which also entails thousands and thousands of the kings and queens of the ethnos that will stand against him also. That's the fullness of time. 26. And so all Israel shall be saved, as it is written, there shall come out of Zion the deliverer, and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. That's also given a time. That gives a time to you if you understand the mystery. Let me ask you a question. There is only one road to salvation, and that's through the deliverer. How possibly then someone that refuses to de deliver could be saved? It's not possible. Then how can you say all Israel shall be saved? Well, it's talking about a time. What time? Think. It's talking about the end of the millennium. When Satan is in the pit and you are instructed as it is written in Isaiah chapter 14, is this the man that deceived the world? I mean... 
How could that miserable wretch have pulled that off? Well, he's, he's smart, and it would appear people are not. Can't even read half the time, unfortunately. Uh, this I kind of dated this. You look south down to Florida, and you find out why people that can't read shouldn't vote, shouldn't be allowed to vote. Verse 27. So verse 27 reads, For this is my covenant unto them, when I shall take away their sins. When, when are sins taken away? When, when we talk about a whole family, you know when it is, 28. As concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sakes. But as touching the election, that's to say God's elect, they are beloved of the Father, for the Father's sake. In other words, it is to the advantage, meaning for the sake of, the advantage of, the, um, the uh, Gentile, so to speak, even, that they also are grafted in. They have salvation. It's wide open. Whomsoever will. But you see what it does, then it goes from a national thing. Well, were all of Israel be saved because it's a national thing? No. Because when someone absolutely sees the truth of seeing Satan in the pit and Christ standing here teaching, do you think they're going to go back to Satan? I don't think any of that um, through the seed of Isaac, as it was written back in the um, ninth chapter, would do that. Do you? Will others? Well, apparently so. Verse 19, 29 rather, 29. For the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. If God gives you a gift of, let's say, teaching, you may decide you want to quit. You may decide, I'm, I, I'm, I'm, I've uh, lost my gift. No, God will never take a gift away. It's without repentance. He's not going to recall it. It's like a lot of times I've seen these preachers get in trouble with their church, and their church pulls their gift. Uh-uh. That doesn't happen. Only God. Because it's a God-given gift. What is the word gift again in the Greek? A charisma. That charisma will stay there. It's without repentance. God will not take it back. So don't ever think you've lost it. You may have lost your way. But God will never recall a gift from an individual, especially one of the set-asides ones, one of God's election. Okay, let's, um, let's go to the next verse, verse 30. <clears throat> For as ye in times past have not believed God, yet have now obtained mercy through their unbelief. Now, I, I want you to see that there's a thing of love in this. And I want you to know, and don't you ever think that God is unfair. He blinded them so these could be grafted in. They're all his kids. They're all his children. Verse 31, Even so have these also now not believed that through your mercy, they also may obtain mercy. Unmerited favor, that love of God and love of family and love for the Word, to teach it, to preach it, to live it, to be blessed by it and have God bless you, to prosper you. It's, it is, um, our Father is so righteous in that He's right in all things and we are so often wrong. Um, it's part of, this is God's plan to bless people, all people, all of his children. Verse 32, for God hath concluded them all in unbelief that he might have mercy upon all. All what? All men. God loves his children. He loves every one of them. And he utilized some, and you have been reading of it. You read of it in the ninth chapter. God said, I will, have, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and so forth. That he hardened Pharaoh's heart. Do you think he's going to judge Pharaoh to death because he himself hardened Pharaoh's heart? No. He hardened Pharaoh's heart so that he could teach a lesson to these same people that are in unbelief uh, as far as Messiah is concerned. 
That's why it is written as it is in verse 25. So that, uh, and I'm saying, understand the mystery. If, you, if there is a mystery concerning God, it is always right and fair. You'll go a lot further with understanding if you understand the love of our Father for his children. Verse 33, Oh, the depth of the riches both of or in the wisdom and knowledge of God. Oh, it is deep. He is ever so wise. And the depth goes to the point that he never leaves anyone behind that chooses to go with him, that chooses him. How unsearchable are his judgments. That's to say he's always just. And his ways past finding out those mysteries. Well, naturally, none of us can have the mind of God. You can study, research, as long as you're in the flesh. I'm sorry, you're not even about to obtain the wisdom of the universe that he possesses. Uh, but he is your father. Is that enough? Well, I don't think for one that is truly blessed by God in understanding the mystery has never enough because you always search for more, deeper, more searching, looking, always awake seeking that that your father has whereby you are better informed against the wisdom of the evil one that he cannot deceive you I hope that when you do this searching and looking that you are not so selfish that you would only want that yourself not be deceived but that some of that looking and searching is so that your brethren are not deceived. You'll go a lot further with God if you research not just for self, but for family, the family of God, that you are more open-minded, that you have compassion in your heart. That's a sign of God's elect. Show me a man without compassion and I'll so show you a pretender as far as the election is concerned. Just won't fit, friend. And it falls in the same line as uh, I said, when one, begin, when one begins to mature into the wisdom of God, you can tell because not only do they think about the brethren, but they think about hurting our Father. For you see, he's family also. He has feelings. And you're not very wise if you hurt his feelings because he's, he's got the strings that play out your life. He can play a tune on, on your banjo, friend. Real sweet music or real sad music, that's up to you. All right, whether you're in tune or out of tune, he's it. Verse 34, for who hath known the mind of the Lord? Question, what's the answer? No one. It's impossible. Or who hath been his counselor? I'll guarantee you he doesn't need one. I get so amused, and, and I, perhaps this is a digression, be that as it may, I'll risk it. I get so amused when I hear people that teach 1 Corinthians chapter 14 as ministering to God in the sense of ministering. Yes, I, I speak in that tongue because God needs my ministry. Hey, ring-a-ding-a-ding. -a -ding. You know, that is so funny and it's so pathetic. God doesn't need what he was saying in reality in the Greek is he understands what you're saying in your own language. But the people you're going to speak a different language. But they like to get their, you know, so important. Oh, yes, so gifted. Gifted in ignorance, I suppose. Well, I'm making friends and influencing people. God does not need someone to minister to him. God does not need a counselor for his own benefit. He's it. He is, the, he is from whom uh, uh, knowledge and wisdom flows. He is the... Um, Father and the creator of the entire universe. And it is from him 
that all knowledge flows and uh, through him. I want, I'm going to go to Proverbs just a second, verse 7 of chapter 1, Proverbs. I'm just throwing this in. The fear of the Lord, that's to say the reverence, your love for the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. But fools despise wisdom and instructions. To love God is where wisdom begins, where knowledge begins. Never forget that verse, all right? If you ever think you've done something kind of dumb, remember Proverbs chapter 1, verse 7. It kind of humbles one, you know, but uh, no, God doesn't need a counselor. He will counsel you, though. That's why he wrote you this letter called the Word of God. Verse 35, or who hath first given to him, and it shall be recompensed unto him again. Um, you can't, you can't give love to God that it's not returned a hundredfold from him. Okay? You can't give that reverence to him that it isn't returned to you. He will always recompense you for what you do for him. When you serve him, and it, it may be just simply, you know, a lot of people think, well, if I'm going to serve God, I must be a teacher. No, that isn't necessary. Isn't necessarily what God would have you do. You may have such a strong personality that all you have to do is walk in a room and the people just automatically feel better. They're blessed because a child of God has walked among them. There are many gifts, and certainly teaching is a labor, but there are gifts that bring joy to people's hearts just simply by feeling the presence of God in a room. What a precious gift. And I would remind you again, all gifts are given without, re, without um, recall. God's not going to recall them. Uh, verse 36, for of him, our Father, of him and through him and to him are all things to whom be glory forever. Amen. All things come through him, for him, to him. What are we talking about primarily? Eternal life. The subject is salvation saved from what? Death. That through him, in him, in his love, you gain that eternal life with completeness and with happiness. That's what he has to offer. That's the commission. I, I teach the Great Commission to be quite longer. I have to teach the whole Word of God as the Great Commission because I don't think you can take a one verse Charlie's aspect. So just take this little verse and you'll, you can get by for 20 years just preaching it. Uh, no. It takes the whole Word of God for God is all wisdom and knowledge. And if you're going to help people, don't help them by putting a patch on their mind of a little Band-Aid. Help them with the truth of God's Word. Okay, now we come in this uh, book of Romans to chapter 12. And in as much as amen, that's that, that's the way it is, and that's the way it's going to be. That's what amen means. Take it, like it, lump it, that's it. But this 12th chapter tells you, um, I don't have a companion Bible at hand here, but uh, if you will look at your outline for this 12th chapter, if my memory doesn't fail me from verses 1 through 9, it deals with your association with brethren. And then from 9 to, I believe, almost to the end of this chapter, it deals with social, that is to say, in the community. How, how you deal with the community to be a successful, happy Christian and have peace of mind, all right? Again, verses 1 through 9, dealing with brethren. 9 to the, you know, practically to the end of the chapter, dealing with society. How do you get along in the world, all right? And uh, the world itself will come up in the third chapter. How do you understand the world governments? It's governmental in chapter 13. Verse, chapter 12, verse 1. 
Uh, and it reads, I beseech you, therefore, or I appeal to you now, brethren, by the mercies of God, his unmerited favor is love, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. It's your reasonable duty. If God gives you love, and if God gives you knowledge, if God gives you wisdom, it's only reasonable that, uh, that you give him your uh, duty of living a Christian life among the brethren, period. All right? Now, that doesn't mean you've got to take a bunch of junk off of somebody. All right? You stand your own ground. But at the same time, knowing God loves his children, and it is your duty to love him in return, if you want to receive the blessings. Verse 2, and be not conformed to this world. That, that means the ways of the world. But be ye transformed by the renewing, the renewing of what? The renewing of your mind, that's your spirit, your intellect, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God? In other words, when you... Well, how do I do that? By learning your Father's Word. By accepting as much as you can attain in the mystery of God in His wisdoms and in His wisdom and His knowledge, whereby you can be a blessing to the brethren by doing your duty of absorbing them, by... Um, uh, not going a along with the ways of this world. That is to say, the, that um, uh, try to live without God. But to renew. Well, how do I renew my mind? Study, study, study. Not, don't become a fanatic. For no one will listen to someone that is fanatical in anything. You must be wiser than the serpent coming out the gate, or you're lost, friend. You'll never make it. You've got to be presentable. You've got to be wise. And inasmuch as all wisdom comes from God, guess where you're going to have to uh, 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 receive it from? Guess where you're going to find wisdom is from God, from our Heavenly Father. Our Father knows what tomorrow brings. That's why he can uh, touch the prophets and had, the right, had them right for your benefit the prophecy exactly as how this earth age this dispension of dispensation excuse me of time will go down verse 3 for i say through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think but to think soberly that means sanely, according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith or gifts, okay? Um, don't, don't overestimate yourself, all right? Um, many times when God blesses us, if you were not careful, you could let that go to your head, okay? And one of the best ways to realize that uh, it should not go to your head and you should not think, well, every time I walk in a room, the people just smile, they feel better, and ask me about God. It's me. No, it isn't you. It's the gift God has given you. Therefore, it is God. So you want to be real careful how you estimate yourself. I could use myself as an example. Here, I have a platform that is, is international. I mean, in a little bitty town of 1,500, we can push a button and wacko. I mean, we're instantly around the world. I must really be somebody. Uh-uh. Not at all. Our Father is. Our Father gives us gifts. They're not ours. They belong to Him. We only use them. So don't think one of the quickest ways you can separate yourself from God without even being aware of it is to get sold on yourself. All right? Hey, you, 
you know the way you take your socks off and put them on, friend. You think about it. All right? Don't think more of yourself than you should and make sure that your measure of faith stays up where it should. That is to say, your love for your Father, whereby you receive gifts and blessings in exchange or, and do it soberly. That means stay focused also, all right? And don't protect your credibility. Your name is really something. Your name in the community is what they can, what, um, uh, you know, they, there may be, a, if you walk the straight and narrow, of course, there will be people in the community that will not like you. That's tough. But they will know you are honest and a man and a child of God. All right? They will not take that away from you. When you keep your word, though, they may say, I don't agree with him, but if he gives you his word, that's better than a contract. I like that. Verse 4. For as we have many members in one body, that's to say in our body, in our family of God, and all members have not the same office. All members don't have the same function. You got feet, and you got a head. You got eyes and you got ears. You got a nose and you got a mouth. It all fits into the family speaking in a spiritual sense, all right? And, of course, there are certain parts of the body you keep covered up, too, but it's still got to be done. Somebody's got to do it. All right? And uh, verse 5, where does God place you? Well, hang tough. Hey, you know, hey, you never know. You might, if you're a big, uh, a little toe, you might grow into a big one someday. Who knows? You know, don't give up. Don't lose hope. I mean, after all, the toes keep the whole body balanced to take the whole word forth, you know? So that's a pretty important little function. All right, verse 5. So we, being many, are one body in Christ. We get it done. And everyone members one of another. In other words, we're a many-membered family. We're, do you know something? That's the temple that Christ spoke of that he could build back in three days was his many-membered body. And you're a, you know, you're a part of it. And God expects you to fulfill your part in a sane way. You know? You know, people that they think, well, I'm going to be super religious then. Uh-uh, you lost it. You went overboard before you ever got started, didn't you? Be yourself. Because, you know, God said, let us make man in our image. And when you see someone like a good, common human being, not, not uh, dealing in perverted senses of things God created to be used in certain ways, just an average, natural being, well, that's the way God was, okay, and wants us. Don't be super-duper, or you'll um, end up in self being a self-righteous hypocrite more than likely be very careful think of the family and uh well i think we'll stop there and pick this up in the next lecture because uh, it kind of i want to spend a little more time on that thought we are a family that's what he's talking about and does does the body need an arm of course it does that's why that the arm of the body, whoever fills that part, is very important. This can give you a better understanding of why God would say at one time, if your eye offends you, offend you, pluck it out. He's not talking about your physical eye. He's talking about there is a certain group. A seer was usually had something to do with prophecy or theology. All right? As a matter of fact, in the Greek, a prophet is a seer. The eye. And he said, if it offends you, pluck it off. It means if they go a little bit nuts and start putting out a bunch of garbage that's contrary to God's word, it's better for you to cut yourself off from that group and have nothing to do with them than it is for you to go to hell just like they're going to. Do you understand that? That's what God, why God makes the, the, the uh, saying. It's not literally that he wants you to harm your body. But it's that sometimes we have to trim up and shape up the many-membered body of Christ. 
Well, how do we know that? When they leave being as he has taught us to be. When they leave off from that and start following something different like traditions of men, separate yourself from them. You don't have to hate them. Just separate yourself from them. All right, don't miss the next lecture. We're going to go a lot deeper into this. All right, bless your heart. You listen a moment.